morning. Thank you. It's good to see everybody here. It's good to be here at church this morning with many of you. And if you're joining by the live stream again, my name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here at uh, Crestwood Church. Uh, over these next few weeks, months, we're going to be working through the book of First Thessalonians, uh, one of the earlier churches that had received the gospel. And this morning, we will be looking at uh, this great commendation, this great faithful example that they were, that Paul commends them to uh, with the gospel. And so if you have your Bible with you this morning, you can open up to 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be reading verses 6 through 10. I believe it will be on the screen as well. So let's turn our full attention to the reading of God's word. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord given to our church, and it is given for our good. Please pray with me this morning. Father, whether through live stream, whether in person this morning, whether we watch this later on in the week, we ask that by your Spirit, you may confront us in our stubbornness, our apathy, our lethargy, that you may expose this, the very sin in our lives, that we may turn to Jesus and find great joy, that we may find in the places that you've called us to be in this world a great witness, and that we would be steadfast all the days of our life. We thank you for this church. We thank you for the faithfulness of your word that has gone forth for many years. And we ask for a hundred more. Lord, we ask that this church would remain faithful to the word of God and that your word would sound forth, not just in Edmonton, but around the, the cities of Alberta, the nations of the earth, that your name may be lifted up. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I, I've been thinking long and hard over these past few months of what it means not only for our church, Crestwood, but also the church in our city to be an effective witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. I've been thinking hard about it. To be sure, all of us here, we are, we're, we're utterly broken people. We're sinful people, redeemed by the gospel. But I, I, I want to think about what does it mean for us to be the faithful presence of Christ in your workplace, in your family, here in this Crestwood neighborhood? It ought to be a sobering question for us to ask such a thing. Now, of course, being in the middle of this current crisis, it's presented some unique challenges to us, but I don't think it should get us off the hook too quickly from asking the hard question of what it means to be this faithful witness to Jesus in the midst of difficulty, in affliction, in times of strain. In fact, this morning we get front row seats to a church that was no more than 20 years old. And Paul is saying to the church in Thessalonica, but he's saying to anyone who would read it in the years ahead, listen up. Listen up. I'm giving a report to a church that is having gospel impact to the surrounding regions. The testimony of the word of God is going forth with power. People are turning from the gods of Zeus and other Roman and imperial deities to this risen Jesus Christ. And the report is getting out. It is not remaining low profile. Jesus is Lord. Come and listen. In other words, Paul is commending the church of Thessalonica for their faithful witness to the gospel and he's revealing to his reader, he's revealing to you and me this morning, a few distinct marks of why they have been so effective in sharing the gospel. He's giving some distinguishing marks to the church 
of why they have been so effective. And I believe it's important for us to hear it this morning. And I want to look at a few of these distinct marks of being a faithful witness to the gospel. Um, I'm sure there's more that you can find throughout the scripture, and so by no means is this exhaustive. But I do believe that in our few verses this morning, that these are a few that we can pull from that. So that's where we're going. Let's look at the distinct mark, number one, of being a, a faithful witness of Jesus. To be a faithful witness for the gospel, you must first become an imitator. Verse 6 says, You became imitators of us and the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with joy from the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. As a young child follows and mimics the attitude and conduct of their parents, or as a young athlete looks up to their coach or trainer as they're learning a given ability or talent or sport, so the disciples in Thessalonica were following the pattern set forth for them by Christ and the apostles. In fact, as we read on, and we're going to see this in the weeks to come, the language that Paul uses towards the church is one of a parent nurturing and exhorting his own children. This is an unescapable pattern in the Christian life. If you want to grow as a disciple of Jesus, you must first follow. Older, wiser, faithful men need to take younger men and disciple them, encourage them in the faith. Women need to take younger women and do the same. If there's no one close to you in your life, take a father or mother in the faith and read about their life. Let it challenge you to become more faithful to Christ and His Word. Paul says, you have learned well to be a witness in Thessalonica by becoming an imitator of us and the Lord. But there's layers to this, and he drills deeper on this idea. He wants to be specific. He wants to reveal what are we actually to imitate? What are the very acts? What, what, what are we to follow? And so to be specific, and we read this, one of the distinct ways that Christ is to be imitated, that the apostles, that the early church leaders are to be imitated, was that they received the word in great affliction, but also in the joy of the Holy Spirit. You see, as the gospel began to take root in this early community, it quickly became obvious that the early disciples, their allegiance to Jesus Christ, their following of Jesus, it began to agitate their Gentile neighbors. It began to frustrate their authorities. The way they pushed back, the way, the way that they decided to not follow other Roman gods and the gods of that day, it fundamentally said, front and center, that Jesus is Lord and everything else has lost sight of this maker of heaven and earth. In fact, in Acts 17, the great historical document of the early church, it was known that Paul went to preach in this very city that Jesus died and he rose from the dead. And how did the townspeople respond? Well, they formed a mob and they began to push these people out of the city saying, these men are turning the world upside down. It's quite a thing to say about this early church who is following the life of Jesus Christ. These men following the gospel, they're turning the world upside down. It certainly was not private or relegated to the corners of their own home. No. This was seen in society and in the world and they suffered for it. From the human perspective, why would anyone take joy in this kind of suffering? We don't want to suffer. There's no good reason for it. In fact, as a culture, we shrink away from any kind of suffering. We want to escape from it. If we had one great virtue in our culture and our world is that we want to seek comfort at any cost. This is one of the highest goals of our society. But here's the promise of the Scripture. The promise of the Scripture is that the Holy Spirit gives joy to us. That just as we receive faith in salvation, we also receive joy from the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, one of the greatest sermons preached and read in the Bible, Jesus in his own words, he says this. 
Blessed are you when you, when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Listen, as you go out and as you proclaim the good news of Jesus, as you stand as a faithful witness to Christ, you will be reviled, you will be persecuted, false things will be said against you. But don't hang your head in shame. No, rejoice and be glad. You have a great reward in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets that were before you. Do not think it is strange. And of course, Jesus didn't just say these words. After all, he lived them. Wasn't it Jesus, after all, who endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him, that he was scourged and that he was mocked and beaten And yet he had great joy knowing what would come afterwards. Paul likewise was no stranger to joy in suffering. In fact, we read again in Acts, after a long day of being flogged and arrested and pushed pushed out of the city, him and Silas finally became arrested. And at midnight, their response was to break out into psalms and hymns and praise towards God. This means we can take courage today when we face ridicule, when found out that we spend half of our weekend worshiping at church, or for the young people who are listening here, that to follow a Christian worldview may be perceived as unsophisticated or mocked or called closed-minded and bigoted. Stand firm. Maybe there's someone in your family who keeps you at arm's length because of your convictions to the Scripture. The truth is, to follow after Jesus, to give our allegiance to Christ, means at some point in your life you will run into conflict. You will face resistance. You will be mocked. Again, don't hang your head low in shame. Rejoice, rejoice that you are counted worthy to bear the name of King Jesus. This was the resounding claim in the New Testament, that they wanted to be counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. Oh, I know that many of us, we have a hard time in our context, in our comforts. We've been greatly blessed in our world with the religious freedoms that we've had. But there is a point where we, when we stand for the gospel, when we stand for who Christ is, that it will bring conflict from those around us. This church in Thessalonica, Paul is saying to them, well done, you are on the right path. You are following the footsteps of your Savior and faithful church before you. Stay the path. Stay the path. Receive joy in the midst of it. So we're faithful by becoming imitators in the life of Christ and the life of the apostles. I wasn't sure if I was going to say this, But this is a great, I'll I'll just make a brief remark, that this is a great indictment even to the church who believes that our life ought to be comfortable and prosperous and wealthy. Paul Paul has no grid at all for any kind of prosperity gospel in saying if you're going to live the Christian faith, you need to be an imitator of Christ and the early church leaders, which is to suffer. In fact, all the disciples, they went on to suffer for the name of Christ. Most Christians outside of the Western world had suffered for the name of Christ. There was no grid in his mind to follow after Jesus meant that you would be healthy and wealthy and prosperous. That is nowhere found within the Bible. We're called to imitate. Secondly, to be a faithful witness for the gospel, we need to center our lives on God's word. We need to center our lives in God's word. We find this in verse 7 and 8. How exactly was their witness used to influence and be an example to the Christians around them? I want to suggest two ways this morning. Firstly, the proclamation of the word of God. And secondly, the practice of truth. The proclamation of the word of God and the practice of truth. We read in verse 7 that they became examples to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia, for, 
the word of the Lord sounded forth from them. The word of the Lord sounded forth from them. This phrase, sounded forth or echoed, could also be translated as to resound or to ring forth. The Apostle Paul, in essence, he saw these joyful, suffering, faithful Christians as these megaphones who sent the word of the gospel into the surrounding regions. The gospel was bearing fruit. It was going out to the world that it was having impact. Now, if you could humor me for a second, this could be an illustration. It wasn't because of how great their programs were. We don't necessarily learn who the preacher was as Paul had left there after the gospel had been settled in the church, who the the preacher was that previous week, how wonderful the music may have sounded when they sang together. All those things can be important and good things. But it was the faithfulness to the word of the Lord that was bursting forth. This was what was bringing revival to these cities. It was the centrality of God's word. I can picture in my mind Presumably these Greek believers with these scrolls as Paul had taught in the synagogues and went through the city as they written things down about how Jesus was now Lord and the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies and how all of truth was bound up in him as they'd written these things down when he was in town to teach were now gathering around dinner tables on rooftops in fields and it was bringing people to life. People were being saved and someone would say to another, I need to go and tell so-and-so about this. I need, to, I need to go into the following city. I need to follow, go and tell my friends. And this news began to spread like wildfire. The word of the Lord was sounding forth. This isn't hard for me to believe. Years ago, I spent time in Southeast Africa doing some mission work. And there was times where we did trips into the village, we'd go for a few days into the most remote places who'd never heard the gospel since Noah. Never heard the name of Jesus, often not even a a Bible to read. We meet with the chief of the the village and we'd say, we have good news. We have good news to share. And we begin to share very simply the knowledge of the gospel, what Christ has done and how God had entered into humanity to redeem people. And then we'd We'd, we'd set up a trailer at night and we would share the gospel with people and we'd go around from house to house and share through a translator what Jesus has done. And at the end of these few days, there'd be hundreds of people traveling miles, six hours someone would travel to hear, what is this news that you are sharing of how Jesus came to save? You may be thinking, well, this is far removed from our context today. And you're right. But let this be an encouragement to us that in our care groups, in our times of family worship and other ministries from this very pulpit, when we meet together with one another at coffee shops, when that does happen or if that's happening for you, that the word of the Lord would burn deep in our hearts, that the word of the Lord would sound forth from the people at Crestwood. Let this be a prayer that we often pray. And as we read throughout Acts, it's amazing that the language is often used that God was multiplying and increasing His Word. It was His Word going forward in great affliction. So firstly, we see the proclamation of the Word. But Paul says more here than just the Word resounding forth from them. From them. He also says, your faith has gone everywhere, so we need not say anything. It's quite an amazing thing that Paul is saying here. In essence, he's saying your faithful preaching of the gospel and proclamation of the gospel and and the fact that it's taken root in your lives and actually transform you is working me out of a job here, guys. You're doing all the evangelistic work, the very thing that I've come to do You're you're, you're taking away my job here. And there's something that I want to underscore here for a moment. Sometimes, it's easy for us to think that if you don't play any part in formal leadership, you get the sense that you're on kind of the spiritual sidelines of the work that God is doing in the mission and in the church, right? This is for the Apostle Paul and for the Apostles, or this is for Pastor Jeff or myself or the elders or, or those in kind of a formal uh, role of leadership to, to, to bring forth the gospel into communities. And 
certainly there's, there's something to that. But if that is all in what all we think about it, I want to burst your bubble this morning. Because on the contrary, it is the witness of an entire church to be a faithful presence in our city. The entirety of the church it is every life that has been raised in Christ, transformed by the Spirit, uniquely gifted to share what Christ has done for you. Let me drill it a little bit deeper here. Whether you are a teacher, a stay-at-home mom, a doctor, a carpenter, or working in construction, a nurse, a mechanic, a high school student, a university graduate, whether you're here today and you're single or you're married, whether you're poor or rich, the implication is for all of us in lives that have been transformed by the gospel to bring forward with our, with our giftings the, me- the message of Christ into our city where the Lord has called you, that your faith would be on display wherever he has called you to be this morning, in word and in deed. This is a weighty call for us. So Paul is saying, not only is it the word Proclaim, but your very lives are characterizing this truth. You're not only talking about Jesus, you're not only talking about the truth, but you're living it out as well. So we need to hear this, that when we speak the truth of the gospel, we proclaim the message of Jesus, that it's met with hospitality and the welcome of Christ. That as we share the message of Jesus, that us ourselves, in a very imperfect way, and looking to the cross and to the grace of Jesus, hopelessly all the time, that we can't do it in ourselves, but that our words are met with deed, that our faith is an example. So Paul commends them for their example as faithful witnesses to the word being central in their lives. I believe Pastor Jeff last week, he said, you can't share the gospel if you don't use words. Absolutely. We need to proclaim. It needs to be partnered with Jesus' words also on the Sermon on the Mount where he said, let your light shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. It is a great disservice to say, come and follow Jesus, and yet with our lives, there is no action, there is no fruit to who he truly is. It needs to be brought together in our lives as we grow in this great gospel. Lastly, to be a faithful witness to Jesus, to be an effective witness to the gospel, We must live in light of Christ's return. We must live in light of Christ's return. This is where I will end today and we'll look at verses 9 and 10. There's two distinct things that I want to draw our attention to in this last section and they're these. Firstly, a transformed life and secondly, a transformed hope. Transformed life is seen in verse 9 where Paul, he draws back to this report he has received from the surrounding regions that there was this undeniable transformation in the life of the Thessalonians. It was undeniable. They were dead and now they're alive. They lived in darkness and now they are in light. They served idols. But now they are turning to the living and true God. Their lives were a disaster zone and Jesus came and brought peace and wholeness and forgiveness and brought them in to his family. This is what we confess as a church, that there is one true Lord, there is one gospel that can save man. There is one faith that can bring liberty to man's soul. No ancient Gnosticism, not Islam, not any modern therapeutic deism or otherwise a God who serves me can rightly demand the worship or attention of any person. It's the triune God of the Bible who calls us to worship him. All other idols are deaf and mute And Paul is speaking to this transformed hope that had taken root in this community. And this was the freedom that the early church in Thessalonica found. The freedom. No longer living under the harsh demands of an idol that only delivered to them bondage. But they were delivered to the God who actually needs nothing from us but freely gives liberty and love through Jesus Christ, his son, for those who would look to him in faith. This is the grandness of the gospel to those who are far off from God. He takes those who are far in darkness, worshiping idols, and he brings them into his family through Jesus Christ. This is you today. Maybe you're hearing this message, 
you don't know Jesus Christ, and you wonder what it might mean to come and serve the living and true God, here would, my, here would be my appeal to you today. Confess in prayer today and to those around you that you want to turn from a life of idols, the things that we have elevated in our life in the place of our Creator, and find forgiveness of sins in Jesus Christ. To turn from that and to turn to Jesus who gives freedom in life in love and the forgiveness of our sins. Turn and repent and come to the Creator who loves you, who died for you, who's redeemed you. Come to Him in faith. But for the Christian today, it's true that we have been delivered from idols, but the battle of idolatry is still a very present battle in our lives. We deal with it daily. We see this in the way we spend our time our resources, where our minds go when we're disappointed or when calamity comes our way. I would appeal to you as well. The Christian needs to look to Jesus Christ, to look away from ourselves, to put on the new man, to walk in the spirit that we may put to death the idols in our heart that enslave us, that enslave you and keep you from serving this true God. As we live in light of Christ's return and seek to be his faithful witness, we see a transformed life that Paul was speaking about here. Let me end here in speaking about the transformed hope that informs how we ought to be a witness. The church of Thessalonica was to wait for Jesus to come from heaven, whom who God raised from the dead. And this Jesus would come and deliver us finally from the wrath of God. Here's a few things that Paul is saying here. The proclamation of Jesus' resurrection asserts that there is one capable of delivering God's people. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, because God raised him from the dead, then we can have a sure confidence that he will return and bring deliverance to his people. And so we look forward with patience and confidence. Today, in the midst of our affliction, maybe you're not persecuted. But in the midst of our trials and suffering, we wait patiently in confidence that this God will return, that Christ will return. It's been 2,000 years since this book was written. We ought not lose hope, though. It might be another millennia before Christ returns, but he will return. It is certain and a truth of the scriptures that we need to place our hope in. And so, like a like someone preparing their home for a visitor to come. We prepare, we rearrange our lives so that the visitor will feel at home in our lives. And so also, with sanctified sanctified hearts, we prepare our lives for his return. This is a hopeful reality, let me end here, that Christians look forward to because they will be delivered from the wrath of God for all those who embrace him by faith. It's a beautiful hope. Let me conclude by reading Psalm 68, verses 1 to 3, that I think encapsulates this so well of what our hope is in living in light of Christ's return. God shall arise. His enemies shall be scattered. And those who hate him shall flee before him. As smoke is driven away, so you shall drive them away. As wax melts before fire, so the wicked shall perish before God. But, but the righteous shall be glad. They shall exult before God. They shall be jubilant with joy. It's the truth, if you follow Christ today, that we can know this joy. We can be jubilant and exulting God today, but we can also look forward to that day where finally all of God's enemies will be scattered and we will be glad with him for all of eternity. Please pray with me. Father, we confess that we are weak, we're feeble people, that maybe some of these truths seem difficult to understand today or we're confused about them. But one thing for sure, Lord, is that we desire to be a faithful presence of Christ in our city. We want to be a, a city on a hill that as this Crestwood community and, uh, and the Edmonton neighbors around us, that they may see the hope of the gospel, that they may see the beauty of Jesus 
through our words and through our actions and through this corporate example of your body, that just as Paul looked upon the church of Thessalonica and said, well done, you're being an example to believers everywhere. Lord, as we struggle and as we learn in this place of discipleship, may we also give a report to the believers in our own city and around the world of the faithfulness of Jesus. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen.